Hello everybody and welcome back. First of all, I want to wish each and every one of you Merry Christmas and uh, I hope that you have a great season and that you have a good rundown to the start of 2022. Um, I hope that you're all healthy, safe, um, and that all this stuff that's going on in the world right now just doesn't affect you. Um, it's hard times, um, I know that. Uh, we just have to get through them somehow. Uh, it's probably going to be um, another pretty bad year, uh, but somehow we're gonna make it. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to wish you all a great Christmas season, a happy new year, wherever you are. Um, take a bit of time off, uh, just cool down, and uh, then let's start again. Oh, that was the important part of this video. <laughs> um, I want to start into the second part and I'm going to go into some of the things that have happened and some of the things that are going to happen in the future. And um, I hope this doesn't end up to be too much of a rant, but I'm just going to start right now. So, um, the last few things that I've been doing, um, some of them on camera, some of them off camera, uh, were related to some of the emulators that I've been working with and uh, some of the old projects um, like the CNC boards and some 3D printing stuff. And um, about two, well, about two years ago or so, um, a lot of things changed for me uh, when my dad died and um, that was a pretty stupid situation and um, it apart from it being sad and everything it left me with a lot of responsibility that uh, I didn't know before so uh, that was really time consuming and, and everything was just different after that uh, but I I was continuing with the work and everything and um, I was actually working on the Altair emulators and I was making new boards for that and I started out making a new project um, where I wanted to make an emulator board for uh, something that could maybe emulate a VAX or a PDP or something like that. And I was very heavily drawing on uh, on the concepts uh, of the Neon 816. Uh, that was that was a really great board because it had real CPUs, real buses. It had um, an FPGA that would do all the stuff for graphics. And I was I was pretty far with that project, almost to the point where I was going to uh, release it. And uh, in the meantime, I had been doing some more work on the on the uh, single board um, Altair and all that stuff. Um, unfortunately, I fell prey to a very very good scam. And with this scam, I basically gave away most of the uh, intellectual property. Uh, intellectual properties and, and all the stuff that I had um, to somebody who was claiming to make some free PCBs for me so uh, I got I got an offer for like I get I get them like two or three times a year uh, we're a new company and we're making PCBs and if you would like it uh, we will make uh, I don't know 10 PCBs for you we'll assemble them free of charge whole thing and they were really nice to me and I said oh I have this new project and I told them about the project and they were like oh yeah we would like to do that so I did send them a few Gerber files um, I sent them the pick and place information I sent them everything they needed to get going and I think they actually made some boards uh, but then they came back and said oh yeah we would like to have the code too and I was like I don't have any code yet and they got really angry and they were trying to pressure me into releasing the code so they could test the boards. They wouldn't send them to me without testing them first. 
And um, yeah, that went ugly really fast. And after that, I was just pretty much bummed out. Um, I'm used to these small scams that you get from China, but, but those guys, they were, uh, they were really, they were making me mad in ways that I hadn't been mad before. And so I binned the entire project. I did not release any code, and in fact, I've never revisited anything that I did there. Um, but the thing's been done for about a year now, and I haven't heard of them again, so I think they're just mad at me right now. So, in the meantime, I started working more on the emulation side. So, uh, um, I reworked these boards, I got to the point where they can do a lot of stuff, and uh, I ported a Commodore 64 emulator to the same board and it was all fine. But the one thing that I never really got over was I was never able to use HDMI as an output and I really wanted that. But HDMI was always really expensive. The, until you get to the point that you can connect one of these stupid little cables, um, you've invested something like 25 to 40 euros on each and every board just so you get this thing to work and and I hated that I'm I was really mad I was mad at myself because I couldn't get it to work I was able to get some bit banged uh, DVI working over HDMI cables but it wasn't the real thing and so um, I was doing a lot of stuff uh, I was trying uh, some more controller boards. Uh, I started working with Raspberry Pi and, um, and I did a lot of work on emulators on Raspberry Pi, but it just wasn't the real thing. Until the Raspberry Pi Zero 2 came to market. And um, there should be one here somewhere. Um, or maybe not. The Raspberry Pi Zero 2 has something that the others didn't have before. First of all, it's built on a uh, on the core of the Raspberry Pi 3, which is really fast. But they updated the GPIO on these things so that it could go crazy fast compared to the um, Raspberry Pi Zero without any extension. And I got the idea that if I had a computer chip, like, let's say, for example, a uh, 6502, you can still buy these and you can actually get them in 3.3 volts and they can go pretty fast and uh, they're like pretty simple chips to work with. And if I could just have, I don't know, like 27 or 28 GPIO lines that could go like a megahertz then I would be in the clear and I could do things like actually hook this thing up to a Raspberry Pi Zero and let the Raspberry Pi be the memory and, and bus and clock generation and everything so basically if you have a computer it's always the same thing I, I picked this off the internet uh, you have your CPU, you've got some RAM, you've got some ROM, and you have some I.O. You have clock generation, and that's all you need for a 6502 to run, or a uh, 65816. So I started to think about the way to hook these things together, because a Raspberry Pi doesn't need to run an operating system. Uh, you could just run the kernel and one application and that application can do all of this stuff around here. Uh, or you can run a Raspberry Pi just without an operating system at all, but just with an application like you would uh, with an Arduino. You can also do that because you can you can start your Raspberry Pi from a single kernel file and, and it can just it doesn't have to be an operating system, it can just be a program. And um, so I went for that. I, I actually thought, how can I connect a 65CO2 to 
a Raspberry Pi. And um, it might be some sort of little little uh, play of, um, well, it might just be luck. Let's say it like that. A Raspberry Pi has 28 GPIOs. Those GPIOs are memory mapped, so you can read all of them at the same time. And if you go really fast, you can get this chip in here to actually output a square signal that is 65 megahertz. You just have to make it really, really quickly. And you have to do it in C or assembler code. And you might be missing some of your heartbeats uh, because you have a preemption from the operating system. But I could deal with that. And well, a few weeks later, loads of beer. We're in Germany here. We, we, have, we drink loads of beer. I have this. And that's the prototype. So I have my 6502 here and I have my Raspberry Pi here. And I have all the data buses. I have all the address buses. I have the clock signal, which is now generated by the Raspberry Pi. I have the reset, the read write, and the IRQ lines. Those are the most important lines that you need to actually make stuff like a Commodore 64 come alive on here. Everything else is set up in a way that I can still have expansion slots. I could actually have a CIA or a VIC chip or some sort of, uh, of uh, input-output logic. I could have this discrete. The Raspberry Pi is just the memory and for right now it's my way to get an HDMI signal out and it's a perfect HDMI signal. There's even sound over this. So this is this is what I wanted to get. I wanted to have an, an old system that could run whatever and I wanted to be able to connect it using an HDMI connector and maybe some USB. And uh, from the software side of things this is simple. Well, kind of simple. I can just load a kernel and I can have an initial RAM drive and I can just place all the operating system stuff for initialization of the USB, the graphics, maybe even the sound into that initial RAM drive and it's going to boot within like two seconds or so. It's going to have hot plug, it's going to have everything that you want, even network and wireless if you want it. And it has the real thing. It has the real 6502 backend and it has the same expandability. And it goes away from all of the FPGA stuff, which is kind of great until you need to change something. Uh, I was also looking into the use of CPLDs, but um, not right now. I want to get this to work first. And of course, this thing can be the, uh, the back end for, um, for any other type of, uh, of 6502 or 65816 hardware because the 85816 is pretty much the same logic in here. It just uses the address and data bus differently. They're multiplexed, which kind of makes it slower and it also makes it uh, more versatile and it has loads of memory more, uh, but still the right amount of memory that we can just fork off from the uh, Raspberry Pi because that thing's got 512 megabytes. It's great. and. This thing could actually run the code for a for for a Commander 64 uh, 65, and uh, it would it would be a very nice platform. Now, um, I want to give you a short demo of this. Um, I have to clear stuff up. 
but um, let's just see if we can get this to work. I'm gonna stay in shot. I'm gonna bring in a display. I'm gonna use the Altair to hold the display. I'm gonna remove the foil for now. So we need our HDMI. It's connected now and we're going to need the keyboard. We're not going to need um, any network and we need power which we can just take from the power bank. I am going to dim the light a little bit. So right now I have a uh, pretty much standard Raspberry Pi desktop on here. Nothing special at all. And um, I'm just gonna let this thing boot up and do its thing. It's probably not gonna find the network, but it doesn't need one. The wonderful thing is you can just use this thing uh, for over the network. So you have your development environment um, right with you on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it is, it's great. And I've like only fried it two or three times maybe. Um, I'm gonna turn this thing off so nobody gets a seizure. We're going to go onto a real console. And just log in and I'll get you over here so you get a better view of this. from here okay so I went ahead and I gave this thing a name and I'm gonna call it the bad 6502 because uh, every hardware freak is going to tell you what I'm doing is extremely bad but I don't care and I do have software that I'm going to start now and it's not going to do anything, right? It is just going to reset the 6502. And for those of you who know the 6502, you will actually right at the start notice one of its greatest eccentricities. It's the way it does a reset. Um, since a reset is uh, basically destructive anyway, um, and they didn't care how long it's gonna take. They just mangled the uh, non-maskable interrupt code and instead of um, writing its last position to the stack, it's just going to write, it's go just going to read a few addresses because they're just pulling the read write latch down for a couple of uh, clocks. And then the thing is going to jump to the reset vector but there's no program there, so it's just going to crash. So let's just start the back end. And one of the wonderful things of the 6502, the C variant, is you can basically run it as quickly and as slowly as you want to. Uh, it is perfectly state stable. You can turn off the clock at any time and come back half an hour later. Um, the chip doesn't mind, which is great for running it slow. So you can, you can basically run this stuff and debug your code as you go. And so when I start this up, um, the, the Raspberry Pi is going to um, pull the uh, reset line low. Uh, it takes a few um, clocks to recover from that 
And then it just starts um, trying to write its, uh, its state to memory. It, it does that a couple of times. It runs over here and then it jumps to FFC and FFD and it reads the initialization vector, which I've manually set to hex 1000 and then it continues at hex 1000. So that's all the code does right now. And um, that's where development is right now. But I've already um, started writing a program loader. So this code can then just load any available binary that is in the same directory. And um, it will just load that binary and it will start executing it. That is the way I'm going to uh, start debugging this. And at first I'm just going to debug with no um, backend hardware. And once I'm done with that, I'm going to add a few um, memory mapped devices like a console and some of that backend code so I can have some nice output to this terminal and I can just remove all of the debug code and it can basically read and write directly from the terminal if it wants to. Uh, those are going to be the next steps. And uh, yeah, that is basically the whole demo that I can show you right now. I can show you that if I start it again, it's going to go through the uh, same um, reset dance. It, does the reset then it uh, goes through wasting six cycles and then it reads the uh, reset vector and starts over after that it doesn't go anywhere it just crashes right away it gets i think it gets uh, a break and um, it then goes to the uh, break vector so that is all it does but it does really uh, use the 6502. I could have just put some sort of emulator in there. Uh, I could have just had a 6502 emulator uh, prepared so I wouldn't need the real chip. That's also a nice thing. Um, if you don't have a 6502 uh, you can just go ahead and get yourself a 6502 uh, emulator as standard code that has nothing but an entry and exit and you can you can feed it your code and your addresses um, but this is just this is just a lot nicer um, to those of you who, who know a little bit about uh, Raspberry Pi programming um, I am using C code I am using um, memory mapped access to the uh, GPIO addresses and registers. I am not explicitly going through the mailbox interface and um, that is uh, fairly quick. It is, it's almost mind-bogglingly quick how, how good this runs. Um, I've been testing a few simple programs uh, just written in C, no optimization at all and I was able to go to uh, over 3 megahertz um, easily and uh, that would be a very nice frequency for this 65 CO2 and um, I think I think I, we're gonna have a lot of fun with this so um, I haven't um, uploaded any code to the internet for this yet um, because I'm still trying to figure out some of the uh, base things that I need for making uh, the first shield where you can actually uh, just have your 6502 and the Raspberry Pi on and uh, that should work but once I have that I'm going to open source the files for the for the shield itself and for the uh, code that you need to run with that shield um, same procedure as every year uh, just I'm going to upload it to github and I'm probably going to create easy EDA files for the uh, for the hardware and um, after that uh, I don't know where it's going to go uh, I might make a um, 
a layout for a uh, board which has extensions on it um, like the commander uh, commander 65 I'm probably saying it wrong I hope none of those guys see this video um, and uh, then I'm going to start making some some code that actually uses some of the Raspberry Pi hardware um, it would be really cool to have an, uh, a sort of abstraction layer through a memory map device uh, where you could actually use uh, the real frame buffer and maybe even use some of the uh, 3D acceleration hardware. That would be total overkill. Um, but who knows? For start, I'm probably going to uh, stick with simple things for now. Um, I want to try and get parts of the Commodore 64 core to run um, on this combination of Raspberry Pi and CPU and maybe do the same for the Apple II which used the 65816 um, uh, that would be that would be my goal for now um, but apart from that uh, thank you very much for watching uh, still have a nice Christmas have a good um, have a good 2022 uh, stay safe stay healthy stay negative uh, just let's get through these difficult times um, as good as we can thank you very much for watching and uh, bye bye